This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. SMC Podcast Network. My name is Chris Blades. And before I get started today, I want to take, take the time to remind you guys, as always, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode. Make sure you're always on top of when we drop our latest stuff. Also, if you could, please as well, give us a five-star rating, write us a review. We very appreciated. Very helpful. I'll see what you guys like, what you guys dislike, the ways we can improve, all that fun stuff. And also, if you're on social media, we're on social media. So you can find us there, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We can talk. We can chat. We can debate, we can discuss, and obviously, the big discussion, I guess, of most of Monday, because you guys are hearing this one, it's most of Monday, and still some Tuesday, was Patrick Mahomes, because that boy got paid. He got the big bags, shout out to him, Um, well, I think it was a 10-year event, equals out to about a 503 million dollar extension obviously on top of the two years that he already had left over for on his rookie deal so really like 12 total years over 500 million dollars half a billy um so yeah shout out to him the uh, first kind of deal oh i'm gonna say first kind of deal because he's not the first player to sign for that amount of years in the nfl i mean it hasn't happened in a while i know mike vick did it with his first 100 million dollar contract with the falcons I think um, Donovan McNabb did it. Like he had a ten, twelve year deal. I think with the Eagles. I know Brett Favre signed a long, like a longer years term deal. Um, Drew Bledsoe has signed a similar deal. I know more recently Tyron Smith signed like an eight year deal with the Cowboys, but obviously different positions because not the left tackles aren't important and they don't get big money, but they're not getting quarterback money. It's not the same thing. Um, but yeah, so first of its kind in terms of the amount of money he could get. And that's the funny thing when you look at these contracts. It's not like, I know you're trying to compare it to like other sports. So you're like looking at like Mike Trout, who had, I think his his deal was 12 years, 104, 100, oh, excuse me, 12 years, $426.5 million, don't want to short him on his money there. But his is fully guaranteed. So again, it's different. While his is longer, the guarantees are a lot bigger. And I think, Mahomes' guarantees are only for, um, like, I think it's only for, like, $140 million. That's due to injury. And then, obviously, um, the way his contract is set up, the, the more times on the Chiefs, which, he, I mean, he will be. But the more, the longer amount of times on the Chiefs, the more money he gets and all that fun stuff. Because, like, the, the way the contract's set up with all those. Uh, yeah, this is the first time I've ever heard of a guarantee mechanism before. It's not, I don't think it's a brand new concept, but it's just not, not something people mention when you talk about it. We'll get into that. In a second, but yeah, so like I said, shout out to him. Um, a lot of discussion around that deal, like, oh, but I mean, it's the same thing with every quarterback that signs, like, oh, is he underpaid? Is he overpaid? Is it team friendly? How will the team be able to afford this position or that position? Blah blah blah, all that stuff. Um, that typically comes whenever, like I said, a quarterback signs a new deal. The one good thing to come from this deal, or to come out of this deal, and I think Mina Combs had touched on it on highly questionable earlier when I was watching, uh, she said that this was really the first time, at least recently, obviously it's not to say this never happened, but um, it's the first time recently that a quarterback's gotten this deal and no one's been like, oh, did he deserve it? And because I mean like one, quarterbacks just, that's just the nature of the position. People that may or may not deserve the money get the money all the time. That's, I mean, that's just common. kind of have to get over that at this point as fans. But obviously when you look at Mahomes, as I've said many times on this podcast, 
he is the best quarterback in the league. I don't want to say by far, but just like bar none, in my opinion, I don't really see how you can put anyone above him currently. Now, I'm not saying he's the best quarterback ever. I'm not even going to say he's going to become the best quarterback ever because he has a lot of time left to to see if that's going to play out, like how his career is going to play out, um, like what kind of success he has down the line. But currently, right now, I don't really see an argument for anyone else being better. I mean, he's a D forward away from potentially back-to-back Super Bowls and Super Bowl victories. Well, obviously, he would have been back-to-back Super Bowl appearances, but back-to-back Super Bowl victories, potentially an, an MVP. Maybe could have won a second one. I mean, he got hurt this year, so I'm not going to do like what if about everything. But, I mean, at the very least, he would have two Super Bowl appearances and an MVP in his first two years as a starter. I mean, not very many people can say that. Along with, you know, in the MVP season through 5,000 yards and 50 touchdowns as a first-year starter. So, I mean, like I said, I don't really know how you um, say anybody else is the best quarterback. But, so yeah, so the, we didn't have that. That was, this is the one time, because it's going to happen uh, whenever or if ever, because that's a that's an interesting part. We'll talk about that in the next segment. Um, the whole Dak situation, uh, when and if he gets his money, whether it's, like I said, whether it's since, I guess what, they have like a week? Yeah, they have a week from today, I think. They have, like, the well, when you guys hear this today, so the, the 8th. Um, I think it's the 15th is the final uh, day to work on a deal, and if not, then he's just playing on the franchise tag this year. And then they're renegotiate next year, which would be a disaster from his side because the COVID's going to take some of that money. So I, I not that I'm saying Jerry can't afford it, but um, I imagine he's not going to give out the big money just having lost a bunch of revenue from the year before. And the cap's going to be lower and all that stuff. So if I were Dax people, I'd want to get the deal done now. But it takes two to tango. Um, so you yeah, look at him, and then you look at Deshaun Watson. It may happen a little bit, but not. it's not going to be as big of a discussion as Dak, in my opinion, at least depending on what the number is that he gets, which will be inflated because of Mahomes. But yeah, so then when you're looking at the deal itself, um, from both sides, I really don't see it as a bad thing other than the years on Mahomes' side is like pretty interesting as normal I mean you don't see um football players sign those long-term deals just because which and this is I mean we knew Mahomes was going to reset the quarterback market to a degree which he has um but with most of these contracts like they become um outdated very quickly so like Whoever's at the top in terms of like average salary per year and everything, um, or even like the most guaranteed money, the most total money, stuff like that, like they're always one up by the next quarterback that comes up. So, like I said, somebody, I think, uh, I know Carson Wentz at the time was at one point, he was like the highest paid, or at least like top two or top three, um, at least in terms of like like total like guaranteed money or whatever, his cap it wasn't that bad because the last two years he's been on his uh, well this year uh, that's coming up and then last year he was on the last two years of his deal, so his cap it doesn't really kick in until next season, and then it'll start getting high. But now I think by like by in a couple of years he'll be like in the bottom half of the top ten in terms of cap hit, and at the time it was like oh my gosh it's such a big deal, and I mean obviously how it was a little bit um, different with the contract uh configuration he's he's good with the numbers um but yeah so most of these guys they kind of um every time up is just a new new guy coming out on top so you knew that was going to happen here and then, like i said it happened with mahomes but um like i said it's weird because of the amount of years because normally you guys the people sign five years six year deals and then they have a chance to to re-up one like hit the market again or potentially just get an extension and then just like get the money from there and even though it is a full 10-year, quote-unquote, deal, with, like, total of 12, it's really, I've been with Bill Barnwell, had a really thorough article about um, the contract and how it breaks down different uh, qu- um, questions that you could ask about the contract and everything like that on ESPN. I'm reading, uh, I read it on the app. But he's, he basically just said that it, in, in the reality, the structure of the deal is really six years and $183.4 million before the two sides can and will negotiate a new contract after the 2025 season finishes. So, um, with that, like, all right, whatever the total of, like, 500, whatever it says, he's not going to get that because 
it may very well be higher if in a few years he wins a couple more MVPs, a couple more Super Bowls. He's gonna he's not gonna play out the full ten years of his deal in my opinion. He's going to renegotiate somewhere in there, somewhere in like the five, six year range. Especially after other guys like I think it was um like Wentz's deal will be up around that time, Goff's deal will be up around that time. And Dak and Deshaun, if they don't sign long term deals, their deals will be up at that time. Uh, I'm not sure what'll be of Russell Wilson's deal, but he might have gotten a new deal um not too far before that. So he's gonna see the quarterback market and realize like, alright, I'm getting paid a lot, but comparatively to the guys who I consider myself better than then, and I would consider him better than all those guys. Um either the gap's not big enough. Or I mean again, you don't want to sound like athletes are greedy, but at the same time it's like uh you um you see guys that are outperforming their deal in their mind, even if it's a lot of money. They're like, all right, well this guy that I think I'm better than is getting paid X amount more than me, so I should get a raise, kind of thing. And like I said, if Mahomes wins a couple more MVPs, a couple more Super Bowls between now and then, it's not going to be unwarranted for him to uh, uh, for him to want that. So yes, yeah, so you got that aspect of it, and then also um, in terms of, like the new money, it's really not that bad, um, at least in the next few years. Again, because the I mean the last two years of this deal, I mean the first few years um, of the of the of the four year like 12 year total um, or of on his rookie deal. So again, the money's not going to be that crazy and it won't really kick in until I guess what, 2022 somewhere around there. I think, I think that's, I think that math checks out. So that's why his new money is like, I think in total he, the, the highest one was um, um, golf. And when he signed his four year extension for 134 and his, and over the next four years, he'll have um, a one fifty five. So it averages out about to like 15 million. Um, oh, the math checks out to about 15 million more than golf once you adjust for salary cap inflation, which isn't really that much more when you really think about it. Because all these guys, golf, Wentz, um, the two most recent guys, they both signed with two years left on their their deal, which is exactly what Mahomes did. So when you look at the new money in the new years, like it's not that much more than those guys, but. Um, Again, it's still more, so that's kind of what you were going for. So, I mean, you look at it from both sides. It makes sense. I mean, no one's going to turn down a chance to make half a billion dollars, even though, again, the contract will get ripped up at some point. He'll be able to make potentially more than that. And then from a Chiefs perspective, they have their guy tied in long-term for a total of 12 years, but like a 10-year extension. So we're talking about he's 24 now. He'll be 36 if he plays out the full length of this deal without renegotiating or anything. So you'll have until he's 36 and then, and in 36, I mean, that's not that old in quarterback time nowadays, assuming like no injuries and stuff like that. When you see guys like, uh, Drew Brees and Tom Brady play well into their late thirties, early forties, like it's no reason to expect that Mahomes couldn't do the same thing else. He's not going to be as athletic, but I mean, by then he'll, the, the more time he spends with Andy Reid, the better it will be for him and from understanding the game on a mental aspect and reading defense and stuff like that. So once he gets that stuff down, I mean, it's hard to say sky's the limit because, I mean, it seems like he's already surpassed what the limit should be for a young quarterback. But, I mean, then now we're talking about potentially entering GOAT status. So, yes, the Chiefs have their guy for 12 years. And, again, from their perspective, I mean, they kind of – I mean, you knew they were going to do it. They've, they've been searching for this guy for years now searching for that Super Bowl for years now, and they got it. They were not going to let that chance slip away. There's going to be no reason to have any ill will or bad blood between the two sides from the two perspective. Like, what was the point? Just like, whatever he wants, more or less, within reason, just give it to him. It's not really that complicated. And then Mahomes didn't seem like he wants to go anywhere. And, again, we don't really know what the real real money looks like until we see the cap a few years down the line, if there's any renegotiating or how the COVID um, affects things. Or if there's any new TV money, stuff like that. Or cause the salary cap to bump up to where, like, his deal is really not that bad. Um, but it's one of those things where it's hard to really say that... It's hard to really say how much money is too much money for a guy like Mahomes. Because, I mean, anything he would have gotten, people would have been like, yeah. I mean, that's probably good enough, but he, he could have gotten more. Like, when you think of, like, uh, all right, a 10-year, $500 million extension, you're like... Yeah, that's not yeah, that's not too bad. And that's kind of crazy. Like everyone's talking about, like, oh, how team friendly it is for the Chiefs, how team friendly it is for the Chiefs, and then we're talking about 
a guy getting half a billion dollars, and it's like, yeah, he probably could have got more. That's the funny thing about it. Is he, if he would have got more, no one would have batted it an eye. But yeah, so for both sides, in my opinion, it makes sense. It works out. It was going to happen. Um, but now we're just going to have to see how the rest of the dominoes fall um, with the some of the other quarterbacks, not just coming up maybe potentially this offseason, but in the future. So we'll talk about the the domino effect of Mahomes and the Chiefs agreeing to this kind of big, not even just big money, but big year extension um, right after this break. So stay right there. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Before I, um, no, I realized after I went to break that I forgot to kind of explain the guarantee mechanisms. And from my understanding and from the Bill Barnwell article, basically how it works is just that normally, like with each year that's the with each league year, excuse me, that starts like the third day. And there's some contracts that, like, that once you hit that day, all right, your money's guaranteed for that year. But the way Mahomes' contract is set up, and he's not the only one, there's other contracts that are set up like this, they just usually don't get as much buzz. Um, or as much mentioned in the in the reporting of the of the extension, um, I think I said contract. I might have said article when I was talking about, it, but you guys get the point. Um, basically, like his guarantees, like the year before. So, like, all right, so say twenty twenty two, if he's on the team by the third league year, I mean third day of the league year, which he obviously will be, then his his money will be guaranteed for twenty twenty three, and then twenty twenty three, if he's the same thing is he'll get money will be guaranteed for 2024. So basically the way you're um, doing it is that like, if he's on the team, you're basically deciding for, for the next year. Like, all right, if you think he's going to be worth it, he's going to be on the team. Um, if you think he's going to be worth it, obviously he's going to be on the team for this year and next year. And then again, you kind of have to rethink that every, so you've really, it's really like a two year gap as opposed to like a one year, um, two year window when you're engaging the guarantees and whether you're going to keep the guy around or not, as opposed to one year. Which, I mean, again, Mahomes will be, and um, he's going to make a lot of money doing that. But I think that's just the way it was set up. It just sounds different, but though that's kind of the way the guarantees will be set up. Is that each each year that passes, it guarantees the money for the next year kind of thing. So, again, the longer he's on the contract, the more money he'll eventually end up getting, you would think. Because the cap that's down the line will be bigger. But so I, think, I think that's how that works. Hopefully I explained that properly. Um, but, yes, yeah, so when you're thinking about... Uh, I just wanted to take it away from Mahomes and think about the other quarterbacks in the league and how they will be affected by this extension. So first, you can look at it from in terms of, all right, will teams or quarterbacks be willing to sign extensions for this amount of um, for this amount of years? And you can argue from both sides, like that's probably not going to happen. Um, just for one, one main reason is that like the quarterbacks that are around right now outside of like potentially, a a young, uh, a young quarterback, a Joe Burrow, like a Trevor Lawrence coming along in a few years, um, that could potentially get something like this. Like the quarterbacks in the league right now probably won't warrant a 10 year commitment to a team. Um, like you wouldn't do that with anybody over 30. Um, so like Russell Wilson's out, even though. A few years ago, he could have been worth it, but Russell Wilson probably out. Um, based on what we've seen from Jared Goff 
um, this past season and also in that Super Bowl, it would be hard to argue that he would be worth, um, if they reworked his deal, he'd be worth something that big. Um, Deshaun's not going to get, I mean, I don't want to say he's not because Bill O'Brien is making some wild deals. So I don't want to say that for certain, though it sounds like he wants a shorter term deal. Um, but again, you never really know until the deals are signed. I didn't expect Mahomes to get a 10 year deal, even though I expected him to get a lot of money. So you would think, um, Deshaun wouldn't get that because he's had some injury history a little bit. Again, he's nothing, nothing too crazy other than like, well, he tore his ACL's rookie year, but other than that, He's had little things here and there. Obviously, he had the, what was it, the uh, collapsed lung or punctured lung where he couldn't even, like, fly home on the plane and stuff like that. He had the eye thing. Um, so he's had little things here and there, but nothing, like, season-ending outside of the torn ACL. But even still, it's a thing that he, he happened in college, happened in the pros. You, and he's he's a he's not a, the biggest guy, and he likes to move around a lot. So you always kind of worry about those guys, though. Again, if you are good at getting down. That's the beauty of a quarterback like Kyler Murray. Um, because even though he's small and fast and runs around and stuff, he generally doesn't get hit that hard. Same with like a Russell Wilson. Like they, when you're at, when you're not the biggest guy, you, you don't really stand in there and take those big shots. If when you don't have to, a lot of like the bigger guys, like the big Ben's or the Carson Wentz of the board, they think like, all right, if I just hang in there a little bit, I'll be able to make a play. And then that, that, that leaves you susceptible to some of those big times hits. And some of those injuries potentially. Again, there's no guarantee, but potentially. So when you have when you smaller smaller guys, you usually find ways to avoid getting hit like that. So, um, like I said, uh, Deshaun's kind of that in between where he'll he'll get hit, but then again, he's not like uh, like just a, a a dummy back there. Like he's a moving target, so he's not he's not going to get hit clean all the time. But it's not impossible. But yeah, so with him. Um, it would be hard to say that he would warrant a ten year deal, same with Carson Wentz. He has more injury concerns than Deshaun has, but still until he can show that he can play through full seasons, which I mean he did play through a full regular season this past year and did the same thing as a rookie. Um, but again, he got the cheap shot in the playoff game, but he didn't finish the playoff game. Again, most quarterbacks wouldn't have finished that playoff game. Most players wouldn't have finished that playoff game when you have a hit like that, um, to the back of the head with the helmet. Um, but regardless, it didn't happen. He he has had season ending injuries two other years in between his rookie and his fourth year. So the injury concerns are there. Um, then the only other quarterback would be Dak. Um, and he, he hasn't even got a commitment from the Cowboys yet. So how, how can you say that he's going to get a 10 year deal? That doesn't make any sense. You could argue Lamar, but again, with the, the running nature, it's going to be hard to say that you're going to want to commit to that for 10 years. With the, with such unknown regarding that play style, and again, I have to even see how he does this 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 upcoming season because he was good he was good this past year. I don't think he's going to be bad, but again, you just have to you have to see how it plays out first. You don't want to you want to see a, a drop off in play from from him. So like I said, you kind of gotta you gotta wait that out first. But we'll we'll see how that goes for them. Um, but yes, Lamar is the only quarterback right now you could argue would get some kind of long term deal like that. Um, but I don't think it's going to happen. But again, like I said, I didn't think the Mahomes deal was going to happen in terms of the amount of years. So we shall see. So I don't think it's going to really change the way quarterbacks um, are, are contracts are set up, at least in terms of the the length. Because I don't think anybody's really going to be wanting to commit to anybody for that amount of time. But also when it comes to the money. Um, I think it'll be interesting because it seems like the two next guys up, um, both Dak and Watson, are looking for shorter term deals. So it's going to be hard to get that big dollar amount on a three or four year extension kind of thing. It's like it's well, I guess well for Mahomes. I mean, for Watson, it would definitely be an extension. For um, Dak, it's. I guess it would kind of be an extension if he if he plays out the franchise tag. I forget how that works with the contract situation, but again, it's not the money's going to be a little bit different because of um, the new money you would get over the first couple of years. Um, and again, if since for shorter term deal, you're not the real real money isn't kicking in until after the rookie um, the rookie years are up. So for Deshaun, that's two years down the line, and then for Dak would be, I guess, well, after this year, even though he's making big money this year on the franchise tag. Um, so, it would be a little bit different. But again, if they want shorter-term deals, you're not going to get those massive 
um, cap hits unless they're going to have them play for um, $40 million a year, which seems unlikely to me, especially in the in the post-Rona sports world where the finance is going to take a little bit of a hit and the owners are going to want to try to make um, some of their money back on the back end by not paying guys as much or the salary cap's going to be low and stuff like that. So you would think um, they wouldn't do that. But yeah, so it just, it just I mean, it's going to be weird because normally you would think like, all right, yeah, so this guy, normally the next guy up is the guy, like we talked about, is the guy that sets the new standard. But when you look at, when you look at Deshaun, you look at Dak, as this point, I think I was watching around the horn, they pointed this out. Like, um, uh, Mahomes is four and one in his playoff career. And again, I'm not a big quarterback wins guy, but I mean, in his playoffs, he's four and one could easily be five and oh, again, with no D Ford. And, um, I think he's lost. I don't think he's lost a game by more than seven. And in those games that he has lost, like his team's scores, like they're over 30 points, like a lot of the time. So it's the, he's not, he's not, he doesn't have that many stinkers. Like when you see Deshaun, you see Dak, every once in a while they put up a stinker. Or they're scoring like 10, 14. I mean, base game of the year for the Cowboys. Whether he's hurt or not is a separate point, but he looked fine the week after. Um, the Dak put up nine points with the fully, like everybody else on the offense was like healthy and played and everything. Granted, the defense was, was what it was, but he put up nine points. Um, Deshaun, like I said, he was a little um, up and down throughout the season. So, like, he'd have some great games. He'd have some, like I said, some stinkers in there. So, that is not the case with Mahomes. Even his bad games are, like, good. So, it's, it's hard for you to, like, when you're coming to negotiating tape, when you're like, all right, we want a deal that's less than what Mahomes got, obviously. But, like, in a similar ballpark, it's like, how can you say that? Because, I mean, I think they have two playoff wins combined between the two of them. Deshaun and... uh and um, Dak do. So it's like, how can you warrant um, getting that kind of money when you don't have the accolades that he has? Again, they don't have the MVP. They don't have the all-pro team. They don't have, like I said, they don't have the ring. They don't have the the playoff performances, the playoff moments like that. So it's like, how can we say that you're, warrant, you're worth a similar amount? Again, not the same, but similar. Normally, that's not going to be the case. With most guys, so again, you get a new, you're a rookie, on a rookie deal, you get you get the extension. Um, it doesn't matter really who got it, because most, I mean, most guys um, are winning. I mean, I don't want to say most, but people are winning on their rookie deals. But again, as I was, was pointing, I think it was by many times too. Like if, um, like, all right, so say if Matt Ryan wins the Super Bowl in 2016, if um, Aaron Rodgers instead of, um. If Aaron Rodgers and the Packers don't fold up against the Seahawks in the NFC Championship game, if, um, what else? I'm trying to think who else. Um, so yeah, if those two things happen, I think there was, there was another, there was another Super Bowl she pointed out too. I forget who it was. Um, but, yeah, but even just those two examples recently, like those guys were on big time deals when they would have made it to the Super Bowl. So it's, it's not like you can't win with. Big time quarterbacks on money because then that the big thing now is like you got to be on a rookie deal, you got to be on a rookie deal, you got to be like on an inexpensive deal. Like those guys weren't on quote unquote inexpensive deals, and they would have made it to a Super Bowl had or won a Super Bowl in Matt Ryan's case had again catastrophe had catastrophe not struck. So um, it's hard to say that like you're gonna want these guys to take less and stuff like that, but. Um, when it comes to like their deal time, but just like I said, it's going to be hard for them to warrant getting that big money when you have Mahomes, who's clearly a level above, and you're just everyone trying to play catch up to him. But at the same time, he's he's the quarterback that got the most recent deal, so that's who you compare it to. But it's like you don't have what he has, and he's young; he's only twenty four. Like so, it's like all right, it's not like this is like a new. Um, thirty year old guy got a new deal, and you think, all right, I could be better than him in like, um, a couple of years, kind of thing. I know this is a guy that's only going to go up from here, which is kind of scary. So it's hard to say that, like, all right, these new guys coming up for new deals with, like, again, Dak and Mahomes or a uh, Dak and Mahomes, Dak and Watson, are the two next guys up, and it's like, how can you say that they're going to get more money? So even with that, I don't really like. That's the funniest thing is this might be one of the few deals that like it doesn't really affect the other quarterbacks that much. 
again, it's it's it, the numbers are gaudy. It may reset the quarterback market a little bit down the line, but like for this upcoming contract negotiation, especially with what the demands of these guys are, it's going to be hard to argue um, that they deserve what he got. But again, if you're the Cowboys, or more specifically than the Texans, because the Texans are a little all over the place. If you're the Cowboys, you kind of held firm on this five-year deal, like a longer-term commitment from Dak, as opposed to like a four-year um, that I, th- I believe is that that's what the rumor out there that that's what he's been wanting. And then you're like, all right, see, Mahomes can commit to the team for longer term, so why can't you? That's really the only real um, positive for either of these sides in this is that, like, all right, you have examples of teams being like, all right, we want to, like, Mahomes able to commit to us, to the Chiefs for 10 years on top of the two that you already had. If you want to be a Cowboy and you say you want to be a Cowboy for your entire career, all right, then you can do the same thing. So... That that's the only way I think it's going to really affect things. But like I said, Bill Barnwell had an interesting article about this, so I would read up on that. It was very, very extensive, um, and like I said, broke down a lot of different things and a lot of the things that I talked about, and even some of the things that I didn't talk about, like um, um, what it means for Chris Jones, and like I said, if there really is a winner or a loser, like how, um, like I said, how everything breaks down and all that stuff. So if you want to read that. I would recommend, but I do, the only last thing I'll say is I do believe that the Cowboys will get a deal done. I mean, with Watson, they don't really have to, so you don't really know, but I do think this will incentivize them to get a deal done just because you don't want, if I'm the Cowboys now, I don't want Deshaun getting another deal too because that really messes you up. Like the Mahomes deal was like, you knew he was going to get a lot of money, so it is what it is. The Deshaun deal that he's more comparable to Dak in terms of like talent level and is he better? Is 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 Deshaun better? Is Dak better? So if he gets something bigger than what you want to pay, then that's gonna there are something maybe lower than you would you want from Dak's side. That's gonna hurt in negotiation. So I think it, you kind of want to get out in front of that because the the Mahomes thing's already kind of screwed you up to a degree. But again, his contract is like an outlier in my opinion in terms of the years and the money and stuff like that. No one else is getting that right now at least. So. Um, for both sides, I think it'll probably incentivize them to be like, all right, we can probably get this done. And like I said, from from both perspectives, you you want to if you're Dak side, you want to get it done just so um, in case Deshaun decides to take less and it makes you look bad. And then if you're Jerry, you want to get it done in case um, he raises the 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 price of what Dak is going to ask for because you already don't want to pay him. In theory, you don't want to pay him whatever the number is now. So if it goes up, I don't imagine you're going to want to pay that. So. Like I said, I think that don't incentivize them to get a deal. And they got a week to do it. Um, but yeah, we'll see. So stay we'll stay tuned for that. See if any more quarterback extensions get signed. Um yeah, but speaking of uh big time decisions coming up, uh the WNBA may have a decision on its hands with uh one of its owners who has been outspoken about some of the social justice stuff that the WNBA has been doing. And a lot of players are not happy about it. So we'll talk about all that stuff right after the break. Stay right there. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. SMCpodcast.com for more info. Atlanta Dream, that is, 
uh, Kelly Lofeller, don't know if I pronounced that right, um, has been critical or was critical of the uh, WNBA's Black Lives Matter initiative. And uh, yeah, it rubbed people the wrong way, as you would expect. This is from ESPN. Uh, Senator uh, Kelly Lofeller, from obviously she represents Georgia, um, who happens to be a co-owner of the Atlanta Dream, has written WNBA Commissioner Kathy Engelbert to express her opposition to the Black Lives Matter movement and ask the league to put an American flag on every jersey when play resumes later this month. The fellow was responding to the WNBA's having approved displaying Black Lives Matter prominently on the court at the AMG Academy in Bradenton, Florida, where the league will hold its season. Obviously, the WNBA and its union also agreed to honor women such as Sandra Bland, Bianca Taylor, and Vanessa Gillian have died in connection with police action or alleged racial violence. Vanessa Gillian was obviously the soldier. I don't, again, I don't know the correct terminology with the ranks and stuff, but she was a soldier that was from Fort Hood that, um, uh, that there was a lot of, uh, media coverage for it and she, her remains were found. I think it was last week. This story was, th- uh, this story's tragic if you read up on it. Not that any of these stories aren't tragic, but that one was like especially tragic. The they really failed her, like they do a lot of uh, black and brown women. Uh, Lefeller, a staunch a staunch reporter of the president, wrote, "I am adamant. I adamantly oppose the Black Lives Matter political movement, which has advocated for the defunding of police, called for the removal of Jesus from churches, and the disruption of the nuclear family structure, harbored anti-Semitic views." and promoted violence and destruction across the country. I believe it's totally misaligned with the values and goals of the WNBA and the Atlanta Dream, where we support tolerance and inclusion. She told Engelbert that she was incredibly disappointed to read about efforts to insert a political platform into the league, adding, the truth is we need less, not more politics and sports. In a time where polarizing politics is as divisive as ever, that's probably the only thing she said so far that I agree with, um, sports has the power to be a unifying antidote and there it is i disagree again and now more than ever we should be united in our goal to remove politics from sports i mean they play the national anthem before sporting events the politics are right there um but i digress in the letter the said that she thinks adding the american flag jerseys licensed uh, jerseys and licensed apparel would be a common sense solution um though i was not consulted about nor do i agree with the lead decision in the matter i'm proposing um obviously the um, the recommendation to have the flags. Uh, a number of current and former WNBA players, including Cheryl Swoops, Skylar Diggins Smith, Natasha Cloud, Alyssa Clark, and Sue Bird, have asked Engelbert to remove Will Feller as co-owner of the of the Dream. Swoops tweeted that the NBA must do better. W, um, obviously WNBA player, but New York Liberty player, like Laisha Clara did. Sorry if I mis- mispronounced that name who used to play for the Dream, tweeted, I can't believe I ever stepped foot in Kelly's house and shared a meal with her. It's actually really hurtful to see her true colors. I had no idea why I played for Atlanta. She felt this way, happy to own us as long as we stay quiet and perform. Clarendon told ABC News Live on Tuesday that that's what we see so often with sports, with culture, with music, is that you're okay with black people as long as they stay in their place or they're performing or they're sports stars. So now that we're kind of taking our power back and asking for, you know, better placing in communities, we're asking for more resources to be poured in. I think it's uncomfortable. You know, it's really sad to see. And she goes on to, to talk a little bit more. And then she thinks, I think it's really tough. And as a black woman, as a queer woman playing in sports, you know, my existence is political like sports is. So I think it's funny to ask, to ask like for the flag as well, to like have that on the jerseys. WNBA issued a statement Tuesday saying the WNBA is based on the principle of equal and fair treatment of all players. And we, along with the teams and players, will continue to use our platforms to vigorously advocate for social justice. Senator Kelly Lefeller has not served as a governor of the has not served as a governor of the Atlanta Dream since 2019 and is no longer involved in the day-to-day business of the team. So that's an interesting point at the end. Because clearly she still thinks she's involved. Whether or not she's been officially involved with the team since 2019 um, is a separate point. Though, in fairness, since the last season ended, there's literally been nothing 
I mean, obviously they've had free agency in the draft and things like that, but like, it's not like the season's going on. So I'm curious to see like how much she would have normally done before that. But uh, yeah, that was uh, quite interesting. Quite interesting um, day and a quite interesting reaction only because, um, yeah, there were a lot of players that were unhappy with those comments. I know. Surprise, surprise. Um, especially when you look at it. I know there was a breakdown. And this is from the Kendall Baker on Twitter. He broke down the sports and and the percentage of of white white players that were in the and the percentage of white media that covers them. But um, this is not the main point of this uh, for this specific uh, conversation. The, the, my point was that with the WNBA, there's only seventy percent white players. So that means eighty three percent are everything else, whether it's black, Hispanic, Latinx, Asian. Whatever, there are ninety three percent of everything else and seventeen percent white. So obviously, this is a league, and there again, they're not alone. Most of the sports leagues outside of the MLS and and MLB, obviously, quote unquote wider sports, um, we're going to have a uh, low percentages. The NFL one was kind of high, but that's really only because again, like a lot of a lot of a lot of white people play football. Uh, not like you know, football, baseball, soccer, lacrosse, hockey. Those are sports that a lot of the people are geared towards. Not to say they don't play basketball. Kind of new basketball players that are white growing up, but that's just that's just those are the sports that are more geared towards the African American community. But yeah, so my my main point was that it's not shocking that with so many black um, players and other people of color or other women of color, I should say, playing in the league, that they would want to support this movement and what's going on. And that they would want it to be a main part of the messaging for the WBA when it returns. So obviously that was kind of the big um, debate with sports. was like, oh, how can we continue to promote and how, how can, can we continue the discussion around these issues while we're playing? Because that's, again, why some players have stepped away. That's why some players were saying that they should step away. I know Kyrie was the the big name, but obviously he's not the only one that has stepped away. A, a few WNBA players have stepped away. I think it was uh, Renee Montgomery, uh, Natasha Cloud, and that's off the top of my head. Um, I know a couple more stepped away for those reasons to fight social justice. Obviously, we had the Maya Moore um, situation that we talked about a couple episodes ago with all the work that she's done over the last two years um, with criminal justice reform. And then even Kyrie... Who again? Everyone was like, "Oh, he's just talking. Like he doesn't really. He's not really about that action." And apparently, he's helping produce a TV special on what happens to Breonna Taylor. So, let's see him putting his money where his mouth is. Um, but yeah, so again, when you have an issue that affects so many people that are involved in the league, it's not surprising that they would want that reflected when they came back to play. Because again, I if I think that if they if this wasn't um, and, and again, the kind of the league has to be more inclusive just because a lot of women, especially women that play sport, I don't want to say especially women that play sports, because I don't know the statistics on that, but I know um, there are a good amount of queer women in the WNBA. So again, they're just by, by that notion alone, and like they're open about it, it's not like the NFL or the NBA where it's like kind of, you kind of keep it more secret and no one really says anything until after um, they... Um, they leave the sport just because they're considered more math and stuff like that. Um, they're so out and open about it. So they, the, as just as a nature, they have to be the the league has to be more inclusive in that regard. So it's not surprising they be that they would support issues like this. And like I said, with the whole Black Lives Matter and everything that's going on, so it is quite interesting, though unsurprising, um, that the co-owner uh, Kelly would say this. Because, again, she's in Florida. I mean, not Florida. She's in Georgia, in the South. She's a Republican, I believe. So I know a lot of them are kind of, have been had a little pushback towards the movement and, like, what, what it stands for and, like, what it means and bringing politics into sports and all that, and all that different stuff. Um, They've had pushback on that. Um, But most of them were, weren't were this vocal about it. Most of them, again, obviously, the NFL had this issue where we're just like, all right, we just want you to stand for the flag. I mean, stand for the anthem. Does show support for the flag, and it wasn't about the flag, but uh, yeah, not gonna go back into that. Um, so that you heard some things like that, but now when you have somebody basically saying, 
I oppose everything that these players are standing for, even the players on my own team, that looks a little different. And the WNBA has a really interesting decision to make because this isn't like a Donald Sterling level bad in terms of like, all right, they have secret tapes of him um, calling people N-words and saying that he doesn't want black people at his games, things like that, Um, which all kind of stem from her, uh, I guess his wife or ex-wife at the time hanging out with Magic Johnson and being around Magic Johnson. I think that's kind of all what kind of sparked this. Um, or what all sparked that, I should say. So you don't have any of that, but um, so you don't have anything like behind the scenes of her using the N-word or, or disparaging players or things like that, but she's just obviously come out and give a uh, more politically correct version of that and basically saying, I don't support anything my players support or anything the league's supporting. And that's, again, that's kind of crazy when you look at it because it's like, how could... Like that's going to hurt the team. It's like, how could you expect players to want to come and play for you if that's what your owner thinks? And they know it's what she thinks. Again, the one decent thing that I feel like the NFL owners have done is kind of is, is being able to hide that, and even the NBA owners to a degree, because you don't know what everybody thinks. A lot of them just don't say anything. Again, not everybody's Mark Cuban, not everybody's Jerry Jones, not everybody's even Dan Gibble, where he penned the foolish letter to LeBron. The fact that LeBron came back is... He's a better man than me. But most people just don't say anything. They like When it comes to those type of issues, they just like put out a, uh, a a blanket or a basic comment, basic statement, and then they move and then they wipe their hands and they're, and they're done with it. She decided that she was going to go an extra mile, and now she looks kind of crazy. And like I said, I don't, she, I'm not going to call her the female Donald Stone. I don't know if she's that bad, but she's not that. She doesn't look that good right now. Let's just put it that way. So the WNBA has to um, has a decision because it's like, all right, if no one's going to want to play for them and no one's going to want to be a part of that team, as long as she's a part of it, because again, a lot of people, past players, current players, current players on the team, players that used to be on the team, everybody's like, yo, we got to do something about this woman. So that means if they don't do anything about the woman, the player's going to be pissed. And then, and then again, but if, I mean, I don't know how many of those fans that support her views are also watching WNBA because it seems like it'd be a conflict of interest. Um, but yeah, so you then you gotta, you are worried about, it. I guess a little bit about the backlash of that. If you just like out there for believing something different, cause that's kind of, um, that's kind of what a lot of the stuff is being, uh, a lot of the conversation and the device in this is just like, all right, you can only, basically you're only allowed to view a lot of, a lot of those type of people that have that kind of mindset will say, Oh, if you don't have this specific view, then you're not allowed to speak kind of thing. And that's not necessarily true. It's just like, don't like be racist. Or like support racism. That's really all it comes down to. That's that's again, it's not a political issue, it's just like a basic human rights thing. I just don't support it and like we can discuss most other things. Like your other views, but just like don't be like I don't want I, I don't support the the Black Lives Matter movement. Especially like not like now. Like if you would have said that like a few years ago, you would have some flag for it, but you have more people like standing behind you. Now brothers like yeah, brothers and sisters are like we're not going for that. I'm sorry. Nope. Now's not the time or place to do any of that. So if you that's the way you think, then just like, why do you own the team? Honestly, why do you own the team in Atlanta? A very black town or city. Yeah, and Georgia, she represents, she's a senator in Georgia. So not all of Georgia is that black. But again, you co-own the Atlanta dream in the city of Atlanta. One of the most the populous black areas in the country. And you're just still like, yeah, no. Like, again, you've had, as the one girl, as the one woman talked about, you had black players in their home, been friendly with them, and then like behind behind their backs, you're like, actually, I, I, I hate what they're what what they support. And that seems kind of crazy. Um, so yeah, WNBA has some decisions to make when it comes to that. Um, we'll see kind of what happens with that. Now, like I said, a lot of WNBA players, for current, current and former, want her out. We'll see if it'll be that easy because again can't force somebody, to, I mean, we can force somebody to suck, that's what they did with Donald Sterling, um, but again, if they're saying she's not really a part of the day-to-day stuff anyway, I don't know how much um, they would convince them they would need to do, or what they would need to do to get her to sell, but let's just put it this way, if she's still a part of the team next year, I, um, it's going to be a struggle for that dream team, just because, like, who's going to want to play for that kind of owner, who publicly, like, Put her name behind those statements. It's not like they came out so behind closed doors. She was like, I'm going to write this letter or this statement to the commissioner and be like, hey, this, what y'all doing? Nah, mm-mm, I don't like it. Like just the, 
the 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 the, the I don't want to say not arrogance, but the uh, boldness. You could argue just to be like, yeah, everything that everybody's supporting right now, I don't support it, and I'm gonna put it out in the open. I am more power to her. Um, but yeah, now he's got to deal with the backlash, and like I said, the WNBA is gonna deal with the backlash if they don't handle this as viewed as appropriate by the players, because again, um, they are the ones that are gonna really get get on the commissioner if she kind of um, screws this up. So we'll see how that plays out, but. I don't imagine that woman will be the owner of the Atlanta Dream much longer. So yeah, so going from one tough decision to another, or one big decision to another, um, the Ivy League has the big decision on their hands. I think they're making their decision on their fall sports. I believe when you guys are hearing this, is today, Wednesday. So we'll talk about that, the big decision they have, and kind of how it's going to affect, or how it may affect, I should say, all fall sports in college. Um, once... Uh, the semester, the fall semester resumes. So we'll talk about all of that right after the break. Stay right there. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy dash football dash podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. I won not one of probably the first impactful decision um, in terms of what the future of sports um, in college athletics in the fall could look like. Um, so, yeah, there's an article about this on ESPN from Heather Dinich. Hopefully, I pronounced that right. I apologize if I did. But as we mentioned before the break, the Ivy League will announce its plans on Wednesday for fall sports, which could include a shortened season or postponing the season until the spring. Back on March 10th, the Ivy League presidents decided to cancel the men's and women's basketball tournaments because of the coronavirus pandemic. It was dismissed by many, including some of the league's players and coaches, as an overreaction made by the league with different, made by a league with a different set of priorities. Um, I know, yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, like, I mean, when it happened, everyone was like, oh, they're overreacting, like, it's not that serious, like, it's not that big of a deal, at least not here, like, maybe in China, but, like, not over here, it's not that serious. And then within 48 hours, Rudy Gobert tested positive for COVID-19 and the NBA suspended its season and all NTA sports were canceled. So I'm just saying, I think, or I mean, at least the perception is that Ivy League schools are smart. Normally, you would think you would do as they do. So if they're seeing like, "Mm, this doesn't look that good right now, let's put this to a stop. Or like, hey, maybe we should try this or try that. I feel like they're at least worth listening to. Because again, they were, I don't want to say ridiculed or clowned. It wasn't like that serious, but everyone was like dismissing them like like they said. And it's like, oh, it wasn't. it's not that big of a deal. Like, what are you overreacting for? And then literally two days later, within, well, within two days, I should say, everything in sports got shut down. So, um, I know, shocker. But yeah, so then that, that's kind of where we come from from here. And then... Um, and I guess we're kind of at the point where, like, regardless of what the Ivy League decides to do, is will this again be something that is ignored at the FBS level, or was this something that will eventually be followed? Because I know there's been a lot of um, conflicting discussions about whether spring football would be a good idea, because that's kind of what they're debating on, is whether to play, like, a shortened conference schedule 
or to have a spring football season with, again, a shortened schedule, but it's a spring football season from, like, April to mid-May. And then Lincoln Riley has come out in support of it. He said it shouldn't be, wouldn't be that hard. I know other people, you know, that's stuff in the article, but I know Penn State AD, who may have some other issues she may need to focus on, um, i.e. Uh, the accusations. It was not accusations because Pat Chambers admitted it. Um, but the the stuff that came out recently about their head basketball coach, you might have to worry about that before you talk about the spring football being a last resort as opposed to being the initial option. I mean, it's just one of those things where um, uh, we'll see how it goes. I know the West Virginia athletic director says that we'll pay attention just to see what's out there, but I think their model is a little different than our model when it comes to football, which is fair. Um, um, the West Virginia athletic director, Shane Lyons, also happens to be the NCAA Division One football oversight, or the chair of the NCAA football Division One oversight committee. Um is he also went on went on to say is it definitely going to impact what we do as a whole? Not necessarily. We have to look at what we're doing with testing and protocols and the safety and well being of our student athletes, making sure we're doing the right thing from that aspect to see if we can fill any type of season. Um, mind you, multiple programs have to shut down their off season workouts for at least a couple of weeks, if not for the time being, because of uh, an outbreak of COVID. I mean, didn't. I know Alabama just had the, then I mean they they didn't confirm or deny the COVID parties, but that's again they were they saw a spike within Alabama among like the younger students, and they they said it was coming from the they were having COVID parties, see who could get it, which is wild um, when you really think about it. Um, but yeah, it's just like uh, that's that's not a thing that may go away if you have sports, so it makes it difficult to be like, all right, um, yeah, sure, we're definitely going to be able to play. Because, like I said, they already have to... Schools already have to shut down their workouts. And that's not even talking about games and traveling across countries and flying places and doing all this other stuff. Um, but, yeah. So, um, as we talked about last week, um, TNG Sports reported that the Ivy is considering two possibilities. Uh, complete false, uh, false slate in favor... Um, well, okay. Excuse me. Let me backtrack. Um, they're... There, one of the options is foregoing the complete fall slate in favor of a seven game conference only spring schedule. And like I said, in April, and that will conclude in mid May. According to the report, the conference also has been considering opening the 2020 season in late September with seven with a seven game schedule against only conference points. So, the similar thing, just like you kind of um, skip all those early season, like out of conference games and just play just the conference games because in reality, those games that matter for them. Again, it's going to be a little bit different from most other teams because of the fact that they're trying to fight for like the um, college football playoffs and things like that. So you gotta um, you gotta be a little bit different. But uh, for Ivy League, it'll probably work. So there is that. Um, See so yeah. uh The decision will come on Wednesday, um, as we talked about. Uh, Pac-12 commissioner says I don't think it's going to have much bearing on what we do. Different part of the country. That doesn't matter. The like COVID's everywhere. Um, different approach to college sports. That's fair. And college football. Everyone is looking around the country and taking an interest in what they do. But I don't think it will is going to have any bearing on what we do. It should. Um, but it doesn't say like it will. And it seems like a lot of, according to this article, it seems like it would have a bigger um, influence on FCS leagues. Um, just because, again, they're a little bit smaller, a little smaller scale. They don't have the uh, massive... TV money and TV revenue that they stand to lose if they don't play the full slate of games. Um, so yeah, oh what else? Um, a Big Twelve commissioner said that they haven't been told by health officials or our local doctors or our scientific consultants uh, that we should stop doing what we're doing, even though in in certain uh, states they're shutting things down. So we're seeing spikes. They're shutting things down. So I don't know how. Um, college football still going on. That's neither here nor is it there. Um, my feeling is that in my feeling is you just keep putting one foot in front of the other while until you're advised it's a bad idea. It's a bad idea. Um, when we get that advice, obviously the safety, health, and well being of our student athletes and staff come first. When we're told this isn't going to work out, obviously nobody's going to be resisting that, but they haven't said that to us yet. So, yeah. Um, well, the one thing that the American Athletic Conference Commissioner did say is that he said it's very unlikely that we would play fall sports. 
highly likely we would play fall sports if we don't have our students back on campus. If our presidents and chancellors didn't feel it was safe to have students on campus, it's very hard to see college sports happening, which is what I've been saying this entire time. Because it's wild to be like, all right, yeah, we're not, it's not, we're going to do digital or online learning. But the as athletes, they got to keep playing. So we'll see how that go. So yeah, that was from um, Mike Rusco. Um And I guess he kind of touched on that um, in the short term, it's possible that the Ivy's decision resonates more with his peers um, than the FBS, obviously, like the Patriot League, smaller leagues like that. Um, the question is whether multiple decisions to cancel or postpone fall sports, even at the lowest level, snowball into more. Um, and Oresco, again, the athletic American, the American Athletic Conference uh, commissioner, said that you'll pay attention, but the Ivy League is different. At this point, I think the FBS has to make its own calculations and decision. The Ivy League decision will resonate to some extent, but I think we have to rationally look at our situation and say, look, can we do this safely? No, you can't. Um, but uh, it's it's an answer that FBS schools seem to prefer to get on their own. So basically what it sounds like to me is that the other schools are going to be like, look, I think can do what you, we want. We got to get this money. So we're going to try to get this money until they say we can't get this money. That's what it sounds like to me. Again, we'll see how it plays out. But to me, it sounds like these schools are like, we have too much money invested in um, these in these uh, TV contracts and stuff like that to just cancel or postpone fall sports. So we're at least going to give it a shot, which is, again, the same thing that basically every major sports league is doing. So what that says about college athletics, that they're being run like um, the bigger leagues that are actual real businesses, and these are pretty much run on the backs of unpaid labor, is an interesting one. Um, but yeah, it just sounds like to me that the college football is not gonna is not gonna care what the Ivy League does, and I think they should. Um, I don't think that's the smart thing to do, um, especially now when you're seeing there are certain schools, not just Ivy League schools. I think Rutgers in New Jersey said that they're 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 going all virtual. I know my sister who's doing some grad school stuff at Penn State. They're not going to virtual all completely. But I think she had like three in-person classes and two of them were changed to virtual and she only has one in-person class as of this moment just because there's certain things um, and I think that's kind of where Harvard um, got some backgrounds originally because they were going to virtual but then they're paying full price for things and well, the, the paying full price is a completely separate point. That's a disaster. But that's not the point of my argument was that they were there are certain things where you can't do virtually. Like you can't go to like there's certain people that need to do like labs and work with um, specific tools and things like that that you can't that you just don't have access to virtually, and you won't. And basically, you're just saying you're wasting. I don't say wasting, but you're losing a year of education because these grades still count. They still um, these credits still count towards your graduation, but you're not getting the necessary tools depending on your major that you're going to need in the future. Because again, not every major do you um, learn stuff very specific to your job description when you get out of college. But for certain majors, you, you will. Like I said, you have to do labs and different things. Like if you're doing any sort of science or STEM kind of thing. If you're doing anything with like animals or like psychology, different things where you may have to work in labs or work with um, tools or equipment that you won't have access to virtually, that's going to be a problem. So that's a separate point. Um, but yeah, so I'm saying like if there's a school that already being like, we, um, we're not going to have classes. Then how, like, for a rock example, how can you say that students can come on campus and play sports if it's not safe for students to come on campus to learn? Like, what's the difference? And I mean, and then that's to say that New Jersey isn't even that bad right now with the Rona. It's gotten, I mean, it was bad before, mainly in North Jersey by uh, the New York area, which makes a lot of sense, um, seeing as bad as New York was. Um, but... Again, you're, you're bringing people from all over, like not just people from New Jersey go to Rutgers. International students go to Rutgers, which is what they're doing to them potentially is a disaster. Um, people from, again, all over the 50 states, in theory, go to Rutgers. I don't know the exact breakdown of where everybody comes from, but again, it's just like people from all over. So you, you're bringing, unless you're going to be able to test everybody right when they get on campus, which you won't, because they, they, they won't have enough tests. It's not possible. Um you're risking 
causing an outbreak on your college campus once all these students get back from um, from get back and start going to class again, unless you can have real, realistically enforce some sort of like mass mandate or some sort of safety precautions. And again, they're going to try that with like lower class sizes and like social distancing and stuff like that. But again, if people aren't going to be wearing masks, which seems like the common thing to do in every other country that's handled the coronavirus very well, um, that's what they, they've shut down and they've had people wear masks and that United States have just been like, that seems like a good idea, but we're good. Kind of like what NCAA football is doing is like what the Ivy League doing makes a lot of sense and probably works for the best if they decide to do the spring league. Because again, we won't know what they do. But if they decide to do the spring league, like if there's students on campus in, in the spring, they're already going to be there. It's not going to be that hard to play the football games. And plus, it'll be the the weather won't be that bad. Like it seems like a simple solution. Again, you got to figure out what you're going to do with the draft and things like that. Um, but it's better than trying to play in the fall and then shut it down. Like that doesn't seem like a smart thing to do. Being like, all right, we're going to go about this like nothing's going to go wrong, and then stuff goes wrong because stuff is going to go wrong. And then you're like, oh, we didn't expect things to go wrong. Like, how do you sound? Like I said, that's just a foolish thing to me. Just going to be like, like, look, we're going to go until the Tesla stop. And I'm like, yeah. But, like, you see the way it's going. You see, like, 20 plus how many ever states it is now are having spikes. Like, why are you thinking that in two months... This is going to be perfectly fine when we don't even have to under control now in the quote unquote hotter months where it's just, we're just supposed to kill the virus because it's just like the flu. Like, why is it again? Not to say that no, I understand, I know that the death rate and things are like aren't that bad. Real generally speaking. But again, that's helped out a lot because the that they're testing a lot of asymptomatic people. So obviously, if you don't have any symptoms, you're probably not going to um, lose your life from it. But you, you read up on Texas, what's going on there. Um, in, in Arizona, their hospitals are getting backed up. The ICUs are getting backed up. Um, it's going to be a problem in a couple of weeks, potentially. Again, you don't know. But they're preparing for issues to happen in, this, in in major hospitals in those states. So, again, unless something changes and you we do something to stop that as a country, there's no reason to expect that there won't be the same thing in the fall. So then, if that's the case, how can you reasonably expect to play college sports? Maybe that's just me, but... I'm just saying the fall seems like you should be preparing as if you're not going to play. And then you need, well, you need to have, uh, you take that out. You should have multiple plans in place. Like the, like, like the Ivy's doing, like have a plan in place in case you play in the fall, have a plan in place in case you can't play in the fall. The, the uh, NCAA, it seems like they just have a plan in place for what happens if they can play in the fall and haven't thought about the other side of things. They're just like, Hey, everyone give it a shot and then see what happens. Basically what the NFL is doing. Um, this is what basically all the sports leagues are doing. They're like, look, we're going to try. If you got to shut it down, you got to shut it down. But um, we're going to give it a shot. And I'm like, I get it. But, like, you should have more um, things prepared than just, like, uh, hey, we're going we're gonna to try it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Like, no. Like, be prepared for it not to work because there's a chance it's not going to work. Because we don't have it under control yet. Um, but, hey, maybe it's just me. I don't know. I know how you guys feel about that. But that's just my opinion. And speaking of things may or may not working, um, there have been some concerns with the bubbles that are, um, I don't say popping up, but the, that are being put up for, um, or, or, or being used to play these different sports leagues in. So we'll kind of talk about that, some of the issues people are having, and um, just how I think it's going to play out once all the teams start showing up. Because right now, all the teams are giving out to all these bubbles. Yet, so we'll see how that goes. So, like I said, we'll discuss all that right after the break. Stay right there. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Oh, 
presented by GSMC Podcast Network. So, the bubbles. I mean, there's a lot to discuss with the bubbles. Obviously, the MLS bubble. There's I know there's a big article. I'll have to put it up on the Twitter page. Uh, the big article I was reading about how like their bubbles are already starting off a little shaky um, because of the positive tests and everything that they've had with the MLS. Like I said, once they got started. And then uh, Adam Silver had some interesting comments about the NBA's bubble. And then, like I said, we'll talk about the WNBA bubble and what the players are going through uh, down there currently. Because according to Twitter, or at least the, the videos and photos that have been put out, um, it's not great. So yeah, as um, several NBA teams travel to Florida on Tuesday, NBA Commissioner Adam Silver expressed concern that potential positive coronavirus cases following quarantine inside the Lee's campus setup will reveal... In essence, a hole in our bubble. I've been saying this. In a virtual interview, um, Silver said that the NBA expects more positive cases to pop up as teams arrive to the NBA campus at Walt Disney World Resort this week. But once teams arrive, all personnel will be tested and must quarantine for at least two days. Though, it could take longer than that to pop up. So, um, we won't be surprised when they come when they first come down to Orlando if we have some additional players test positive. Silver told Fortune Brainstorm Health. What would be most concerning is once players enter this campus and then go through our quarantine period, then if they were to test positive or if we were to have any positive tests, we would know we have an issue. Um, We would know that there is, in essence, a hole in our bubble and that our quarantine or our campus is not working in some way. So we're added later. So that would be very concerning. Um, Silver said... The so Silver said any amount of positive cases inside the protected campus could result in a second shutdown of the NBA season. Several teams, including the Nets, who, I mean, they have, I think, because Torian Prince was the most recent guy to come down with the Rona and drop out. So they've had, so him, Spencer Dinwiddie, DeAndre Jordan, all recently dropped out because of the Rona. Um, Nick Claxton is out because of injury. Wilson Chandler just said he wasn't coming. And then um, KD and Kyrie are both like hurt. So I think that's seven guys. So yeah, wait. So Kyrie, Kyrie. I said Kyrie. Um, Kyrie, KD, DeAndre, Spencer, Torian Prince, Claxton, and Wilson Chandler. So yeah, seven guys for various reasons already on coming down. And at least three of them are strictly based on the Rona. Um, and Wilson Chandler just like he he wasn't about the bubble life, so that that couldn't in offense couldn't affect the four people because they're running that were like I'm not playing. So I mean, like I said, they have one more person that's positive. I don't know how they feel the team, honestly, because you can't just have a you can't just have a brand new team for for a, a playoff position. Like I mean, and I don't want to even mention any names to jinx anybody, but. Like I'm saying, if something happens to one of their other main players on the team, like it's like, how do you even t- how do you even have them in the league? They might as well just drop out. Because again, there's only so many replacement players you can have. Like you're talking about, you basically you're playing with a whole different team. It's not even the same. Not on top of the fact that uh, Jock Vaughn's on the coach. Basically, not, it's going to be a different team down there. Not to mention the Wizards, who, who have Bradley Beal sitting out because of a shoulder injury, I believe. So it's like that team's already not like it's like the rates. Race for the eight seed is going to be disgusting. Like the Magic are going to get the seven just because they're the only team currently that's like more or less healthy out of the three teams at the bottom. And then it's just going to be like like there's a legitimate chance that both those teams could lose every game or go like one and seven and two and six, and that might be good enough to um, potentially have a playing game for the eight seed, playing tournament for the eight seed. I mean, it's just it's a mess. Um, but yeah, so. Back to the shutdown. The Nets, Nuggets, Clippers, Heat, Bucks, and Kings have closed their practice facilities in the past week due to the positive cases of the Rona among their respective travel groups. Uh, we began testing all our teams roughly two weeks ago, and we and as we reported, we had a significant number of positive cases. I think it's more of a representation of what's happening around the country. Um, Florida's Department of Health reported about 7,400 additional positive cases on Tuesday. The state's total is now over 200,000, so that's where they're headed. Not great. Um, Silver said the NBA's campus will, with daily testing and and guidance from medical experts, is as protected as possible from the environment around us, which is fair. 
Um, so on paper, I'm dealing with our experts. This should work, but we shall see. I'm confident based on the positive cases we are seeing from our players and the general public around the country that if that it will be safer on this campus than off the campus. That's that that part is definitely true. I'll give him that. In part because of the daily testing. But again, the virus has humbled many. So I'm not going to express any higher level of confidence than we are following the protocols and we hope uh then we hope it works as it, it was designed. Reader he he also reiterated the league will the league likely will not be forced to shut down again due to one positive case, but it, I mean it might halt for more. Um and yeah, so that's already a bit of a mess. Um, you got uh, one team that's barely going to be able to feel, feel, feel the team, excuse me. And you got other, um, guys, or other teams that have had to shut down their practice facility. I think the might did, wait, did it mention the heat? I think it mentioned the heat. Hold on. I want to double check that. Yeah, it did mention the heat. Who, I mean, just happened to be playing in Florida. Um, they made, like I said, that they're... The whole bubble situation could be a disaster before it even starts. Like, if they get down there and more people got to test positive, I mean, more people test positive, it's going to be a mess. And, like, I, I say that mainly because, as um, I think that I think that was part of the, the MLS's situation, was that people are testing positive and then they got to quarantine themselves. And now we're talking about giving them, like, a week to prepare, potentially, for or the, the restart of a season, or the start of a season, I guess, in the MLS's cases. In the MLS's case, excuse me. Um... What there's no reasonable expectation that an athlete should be would be or should be ready for that. Now, that's unfair to them. It's unfair to everybody. Just be like, all right, you've been quarantined, not being able to do anything physically active for two weeks. Um, so yeah, let's uh, just put you back out there and play some basketball. Like that doesn't seem right at all. Let alone do we know how even the effects uh will be on athletes that try to. And get things back started up once they have it. Because again, as we've talked about, like with Gobert and Von Miller and some other guys that have had it and kind of said that it's 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 not again, it affects everybody differently, but it's not it's like an easy thing to work through if you have symptoms. Like it's not just like, all right, yeah, no, I'm fine like in two weeks I feel fine. Like their their bodies still don't feel right. And again, these are the peak level athletes in their respective sports. So so it's not like it's just affecting normal people badly. Again, Luckily, no athlete has had anything fatal happen to them. But um, you just—I'm saying—just an example of that it can it can affect the um, athletes just the way it can affect any other person. Like it might be nothing, it might be a lot, it might be somewhere in between, and we don't really know how something in between um, is going to is going to affect people if they're trying to play an athletic sport um, where you got where you're going to need your lungs and other oh, well mainly your lungs to uh, function. Especially since it's like respiratory and other bodily organ uh, disease. That, that That's what it attacks. I so see yeah, that bubble, if there's a, like I said, if there's a hole in the bubble, eh, it'll get shut down quicker than we would have hoped for, which will be a mess. Because, again, the last thing, as, I, as I've said since the beginning, the last thing you want is to have to shut this back down. If you're doing it, you're doing it because you think it's safe. I think the NBA thinks what they're doing is safe. But I don't know if they think actually doing it is safe, if that makes sense. Like, they're thinking, like, all right, look, this is the best we can do. But the best we can do still might not be that safe. Especially since they're doing it literally in a state where cases are spiking. That's neither here nor there. Speaking of um, things that it could be a bit of a mess, um, though the NBA claims, or they had Mark's time put out that this is just a... Uh, for the time being, when you do the first 48-hour quarantine, when you first get down to Orlando. Um, some of the meals I've been seeing of um, from these uh, bubbles, bit of a mess. Like, they look like, like, like the, some of the like some of the food I saw from, I think it was Troy Daniels and Chris Chinoz. I, I don't know if I pronounced the name right, but from the Nets. Um, Troy Daniels is on the Nets, um, but Chris Chinoz is on the Nets. And the the meals they they had them eating look like something you could order off a Delta or a United flight. I'm like these are professional athletes that are used to not to say everyone eats like the best diet, but these are like they get like five star they have like five star chef personal chefs that cook them all, whip them up something nice, and even if it's for two days that they have to eat like this, like how is this the best like they could get? 
that's kind of wild. And that's just for the NBA. The WNBA situation is a complete mess. Um, like, again, the meals, quite shaky. Uh, we don't know if it'll get better, but quite shaky on the meals. Uh, the laundry room that they that they have is very small and kind of run down. I don't know how it's going to work um, with a lot of people being there and needing to clean things, especially since they're going to be there for potentially um, a few months. And also, I mean, granted, a, a worm is not the worst thing you could find. But again, you shouldn't. The fest shouldn't be in there like the first day. I don't like. Don't have me show up at a hotel or or or, or something the first day, and I find like a bug in my room. Like that's not what I want to see. And that's what brothers. Is, oh, well, no, I guess not my not brothers. That's what uh these women are finding in the WNBA, and it's just like, like it looks like they're staying at like a motel. Like how like how is that? adequate for professional athletes and i'm just saying this whole bubble like it seemed like again the bubble idea is as if you believe in what dr fauci says it seems like that's the best plan is like all right we need to be in a bubble um but yeah these bubbles come with a lot of question marks and not just when it comes to the rona just i'm talking about the basic amenities and the things that they need to do to pass the time or just to to live normally while trying to get through this um, weird year or weird season, I should say. I guess the, the whole bubble situation is a, is a bit more cloudy and muddy um, than we had originally thought. Just because one, yeah, um, the bubbles may or may not work. Again, look at the MLS; um, they got a lot of things uh, going wrong within their bubble before the season even started. I think that I'm, like I, I think I mentioned this on the last podcast. I thought they had a team dropout, or they didn't have a team dropout. They had like a team with like 10 staffers and players that test a positive and another, another team with like five, like it's like brothers coming down there and then like they test positive and it's like, Oh, like what do we do? Like I don't even have a whole team that can't practice or can't prepare for the season to start and expect them to be ready to go. And like, in like a week to 10 days afterwards, like that, that doesn't make any sense. I so see yeah, these bubbles. Now that we're getting closer to the restart of sports, which again, I hope happen, but I'm not overly optimistic. Um, yeah, these bubbles looking very shaky. At the very least, hopefully they can get some real food once once everybody's down there. Hopefully this is just like the, as Mark Stein said, this is just temporary food that you get when you first get down there. And after that, they'll get like the real chefs and everything. Because I'm like, you can't expect athletes to function off of flight meals for three courses a day. Like you, like that's not a reasonable expectation, in my opinion. Um, like I said, some of the meals you saw were, um, a bit, like I said, a bit underwhelming to say the least from my own personal perspective but hey we'll see I, I, I'm i curious to see how the meals look up but yeah like I said that was bad but what the WNBA players are dealing with are was 10 times worse at least the beds look nice um, where they were they had food laid down they looked like halfway decent but I said the, some of the amenities and some of the look like it looks like they're staying in like a rundown motel and I'm just saying, like, I know IMD is a very prestigious boarding school, so I don't think they um, they they would just put them up anywhere. Like, I imagine it has to be someplace nice, but still, that like a mess. On top of the fact that, oh, IMD still hasn't really officially ruled out having fall sports, so if that happens, where in the world are the WNBA players going to stay or what's going to happen with that? Because the whole point of the bubble is that no one else is around. Um, and if there's people around... That's going to be a problem. Also, I think with the with the bubble, I think uh, in um, uh, I think in the MLS, or I saw this, or at least at, at, um, at Disney World, when those when those works are coming back, they're not they're not testing them before they get they, they start working again. In terms of like like the people that are in the costumes and stuff, so I would hope that's not the same case for the Disney like workers that are going to be there. They're inside the bubble. Same thing with IMG and same thing with your um, MLS bubble in Orlando. Hopefully, those workers are getting tested before they get in. Even though, again, they're not going to be in the same rooms and all this other stuff. But still, why would you not have them follow similar precautions? Not going to be the same, but similar precautions to make sure that you don't have, you don't bring it, unknowingly bring it into the bubble. And like I said, like I'm so once you get a, a leak or a hole in the bubble, there's a chance it's going to burst. And that's what we could be looking at if they don't make sure the people that they are bringing in to the bubble aren't quarantined properly. But yeah, we'll see how this goes once teams start reporting. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be a bit of a mess. But we'll see. 
Um, so after this next break, we're going to come back here and discuss. I know a few episodes, well, not a few, a little while ago, I discussed, like, I ranked the divisions based on the wide receivers. So I figured I'd come back and do that, but this time with uh, running backs. Um, trust me, not that many good divisions with the running backs, in my personal opinion. Um, but we'll talk about all that right after the break. So stay right there. Check out the show built around the women of MMA from the UFC, Invicta FC, Bellator, and one championship. We got the fights covered. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Well, I will preface this by saying there are good running backs all around the, the NFL. It doesn't really matter. Um, what division, you'll find at least one or two good ones. I will, however, say that I think outside of like a couple, there's really, um, there's really not a big, there's like a big drop off afterwards. Kind of the same thing with the receivers. I mean, you can do this with most other positions. Like um, I said, the top two or three, which we'll get to. I'm um, kind of going to do it backwards, per se. Um, or, like, or like the cream of the crop, per, or you could you could argue, and then everyone else kind of like filters in. So um, to get through those other divisions, we'll talk about like, so for example, like the AFC East, you got Le'Veon Bell, who was really good before he got to the Jets. Um, their line was bad last year. It was a, last year was a mess. Hopefully he'll be better, but you really don't know. Sonny Michelle um, for the Patriots, and James White, and I think Rex Burkett's still there. They do the trio, but Sonny Michel, again, the line was bad. Hopefully he'll be better. They're going to need him because I don't think they can just um, rely on Cam completely until it's 100% certain that he's back to full health. Um, Miami, I know they signed uh, I know they signed Josh, uh, Josh <laughs> not Josh, uh, Jordan Howard. Um, oh, this is from last season. I don't need last season. Um, but yeah, I know they signed Jordan Howard. In um, free agency, um, so I'm trying. I'm trying to see who else is on their roster from the running back perspective right now. So, um, nope, don't want Tua. I know what position Tua plays. It's not the one I need. Um, so yeah, when you look at their running backs, they have. Oh, I forgot they traded for Matt Breida. So that makes it a little bit better. We got Kalen Balaj, Matt Breida, Miles Gaskin from Washington. I think he was a rookie last year, or was looking maybe two years ago. Um, uh, they got Jordan Howard, Patrick Laird, and then Malcolm Perry, who's a rookie as well. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a bunch of, yeah. And then the Bills have Devin Singletary. And pl- I mean, among other people, but, uh, Devin Singletary is ba- mainly the guy, um, as, as this moment, uh, heading into next season. And it's like, uh all right, that's not, like, that bad. But, again, just a lot of uncertainty, unfortunately, when you look at that position, which which is why you can't, you can't, you, like, you can't really rank them that high if you're going to look at, uh, if you're going to look at our running backs. Um, you also got, um, when you go down to the next division, not AFC North, because we'll get to them in a second, AFC South, you got, uh, who is it, David Johnson, and they traded DeAndre Hopkins for. Still wild. Um, but yes, yeah, so you got David Johnson. You got, for the Titans, you got Derrick Henry, who's solid. Um, Colts, you got Marlon Mack, Jonathan Taylor. Um, who was the other guy? Naeem Hines. So again, not bad, but also like, 
nothing too special yet just because Jonathan Taylor's a rookie, so you can't really assume anything from him yet. But, I mean, he was great early on behind a good offensive line in, in well, at Wisconsin, I should say. So you would think that the good offensive line with the Colts should also be the same thing, um, but you don't know. Oh, I still got, okay, so the Texans still have Duke Johnson, too. I forgot about that. Um, but, I mean, he's all right. And then the Jaguars have Leonard Fournette, who they don't even want to keep. He's not bad, though. He's just, like, not, like, that great. Like, his, his numbers last year were actually, like, not that awful, surprisingly enough. He ran for over 1,100 yards, only three touchdowns, though, but still ran for over 1,100 yards, three touchdowns in 15 games. Like, that's that's not that's not bad at all. Um, but yeah, outside of Derrick Henry, you really don't have like any like sure things because you don't really know before that. AFC West, you got at least you got Josh Jacobs, you got Philip Lindsay and Melvin Gordon who should be all right. Um, the, the Chargers have Austin Eckler who's not bad, but I don't know how well. I mean, he was he looked good as the quote unquote bell cow in the early part of the season when Melvin Gordon was gone um, with the hold on stuff. But again, don't really know how it's going to hold up. And then with the Chiefs, I mean, they're a passing team. But they'll use Damian Williams, who they like. They use Clyde, Ed- er- Clyde Edwards Alaire, excuse me. Um, but again, just like a solid division, but nothing too special. Um, then you got the NFC North, who's um, got David Montgomery with the Bears and Tariq Cohen. Not bad, but not and nothing special. You got Carry On Johnson and DeAndre Swift with the Lions. Again, they're well with DeAndre Swift as a rookie. You don't really know when Carry On Johnson got hurt last year. So you don't even know how he'll bounce back from that. But not not terrible. We got Aaron Jones, who's very good, obviously. I think led the league in touchdowns from the running back position last year, if I remember correctly. And Dalvin Cook, who's very good. And then even his backup, uh, Alex Madison, is not bad. And he filled in decently enough when when they tried to spell Dalvin Cook or he got hurt. And also, back as they draft A.J. Dillon. Um, then you got the NFC West, who you got Kenyon Drake with the Cardinals. Um... Among, I forget if that, let me see if they draft anybody else. Um, but I know you at least got, uh, you know, like I say, no, you at least got Kenyon Drake, and then, and then I know they traded away David Johnson, obviously. Um, but you got Kenyon Drake, they drafted, you know, Benjamin, late round guy from Arizona State. He's actually not bad. So we'll see what kind of role he plays with them. Um, Chase Edmonds wasn't bad. He, he did work on the Giants, if I remember correctly. So there's that. But again, nothing too special. Um, the Rams, whoever they decide to go with, um, with Todd Gurley not being there. Obviously, him not being there hurts um, a little bit. Granted, he was hurt, so there is that. Um, but you, do, you don't even really know how they're going to replace him yet in that offense. That'll be a big deal. 49ers, Mostert, um, Tevin Coleman. Um, I guess Jarek McKinnon will be back this year. Hopefully, he can stay healthy. Um, but they run, they run a committee. They don't really have one guy, but their running game's good. And then with the then the Seahawks, you got Chris Carson and Rashard Penny coming back from injury. So again, not bad, but nothing too special. So that's what I'm saying. Like you got all those teams, but then you got the three, I feel like elite divisions, which are the NFC East, the NFC South, and then a little bit behind them is the NFC North. So NFC North, I think would come in as like my third. I'm just gonna do like a top three. Um, but yeah, so that would come in as third because they got Joe Mixon, solid running back, Nick Chubb. In my opinion, arguably a top five running back. You got James Conner. Hopefully he can come back from injuries and stuff that he dealt with last year. And then for the Ravens, you got Mark Ingram. Um, plus, I mean, it's kind of hard because, like, Lamar Jackson is also, like, a de facto running back because he um, – I'm trying to see, did he lead the team in rushing last year? Yeah, he did. He had 12,000 yards, so Mark Ingram's uh, 1,018. Mark Ingram had more touchdowns, but – He's the fact they're running back. So you look at the running backs in their division. Um, I feel like they're like a solid three because then you have Nick Chubb, who's great, Joe Mixon, who's really good, and should be helped out by better quarterback play, plus more weapons on the outside for people to not focus entirely on him on the offensive side of the ball. Um, and then, like I said, you got James Conner. Hopefully, he can get back because he was good the the last year that Le'Veon was there, spelling him. But then last year again, he had his. Um, issues with the injuries didn't really put up the numbers you would have liked to have seen. He only ran for 400 yards and only played in 10 games. Well, a little under, like 460 in, in 10 games, which isn't isn't great. 
And then you got, like I said, you got Mark Ingram slash Lamar Jackson. So that's very solid. Then you look at the NFC East and the NFC South. That's where things really get interesting. Because you could argue that one of the... That you argue that the best running back comes from one of these two divisions. Like whether you believe that's Christian McCaffrey, whether you believe that's Saquon, whether you believe that's Zeke. Um, I guess even if you believe that's Alvin Kamara. Like, um, you could argue the best running back comes from that division. So... The top two in the East, obviously, are, in my opinion, in this order, Saquon and Zeke. Then they got Miles Sanders, and then it depends on who Washington has. Um, but I think they, they um, if Darius Guys can stay healthy, then that would be um, very helpful for them in terms of like their, their running back game. Because, again, AP is getting a little bit older. But, um, but, again, you have to see and prove that that's going to be the case. Because you really don't know that yet. Because he really hasn't been healthy this whole time in the NFL. And also they drafted uh, well, they drafted Bryce Love last year too, who was good. But then obviously had the injuries. And then Antonio Gibson um, from Memphis, who was kind of a running back uh, slot hybrid. Who think could be, do good things. And obviously maybe replace that um, Chris Thompson role that they had um, over the last few years. So then the, the Washington clearly has the fourth best running back, whoever that is in the division, in my opinion. But the first three of Zeke, Saquon, and Miles Sanders is a very solid duo. And then you go to NFC South, you got Alvin Kamara, um, Christian McCaffrey, Todd Gurley, and um, then whoever the Bucks choose as their guy, Ronald Jones. I think Peyton Barber is still there. Now, let me just I'll double check that for you guys. But yeah, so you got whoever they choose as their fourth, um, as their as their um, as their lead. I don't know, say not as their fourth running back, as their lead guy. Because yeah, right now it's Ronald Jones is number one. So Peyton Barber isn't still there. Oh, okay, that's interesting. I thought he was. He must have left as a free agent. But yeah, so then if you were going to look at it from that perspective, I would argue that. The NFC East might have the slight, slight edge just because you're going into this season. Like, who do you feel more confident in right now? Miles Sanders or, like, again, assuming assuming neither of them suffers like a season any injury or anything like that. Who do you have more confidence in to have a good year? Miles Sanders coming off of a great rookie year with a good O-line and a good play caller plus more weapons on the outside. Or Todd Gurley, who... Who who really don't know if he'll ever get back to his real form? It's debatable. I will agree because obviously Todd Gurley was a former offensive player of the year, former leading like leading or like former best running back in the league, arguably depending on who you like. Um, and obviously Miles Sanders hasn't been there yet; only been in the league one year. But um, I feel like many people would feel like they would have more confidence in Miles Sanders heading into this year. Then you got that coupled with Saquon, hopefully being able to bounce back after um, an injury riddle season last year, and then Zeke doing what he always does, which is just get yards and score touchdowns. So even though, obviously, you could argue based on last season, the NFC South has the best running back in Christian McCaffrey, based strictly on last season. Again, talent-wise, you may argue with someone else, but based on last season, you I would say he was the best running back in the league last year, personally. This is what he's doing in the run game and the pass game. Then you got Alvin Kamara, who I believe right now is worse than Zeke and um, Saquon personally. Again, he had a down year last year too. I just think they can do more at, at their peak of their game. Obviously, he's a great receiver, um, great a great route runner, stuff like that for a running back. But I don't know if I could... Like, I know Zeke can carry the ball 25 times a game and put up big numbers. He did it in college. He can do it in the pros. I'm just saying Alvin Kamara can't, but like... Last year was a little bit shaky once he had Mark Ingram gone. And again, he was banged up, so I don't want to just pin it all on, like, um, he's not good. But you, again, you're just a little, you're a little curious. That's all. And then, like I said, you got Miles Sanders versus Todd Gurley, who I think I have a little bit more faith in um, Miles Sanders personally heading into this next year. And then you got uh, whoever Washington chooses, whether it's Geis or AP or whoever versus Ronald Jones. I feel like you probably have to go with, even like last year, AP, I think, put up close to if not an even thousand last year, I could be wrong, but I believe it was, it was darn near close if it wasn't. Yeah, he put up, he put up like almost 900 yards and five touchdowns in 15 games with not that great quarterback play. 
was Case Keenum was all right. Um, Dwayne Haskins was the only kind of really came on later in the year. So, like, the quarterback play wasn't great. Their line wasn't really that great. Obviously, they didn't have Trent Williams. And the team was just – Trent Williams, excuse me. And then the team was just bad. So, when you're down a lot of games, the defense wasn't that great, like, because of the injuries and stuff. Um, defense wasn't that great. So, it's hard to run the ball well when you're losing. It just that makes it impossible to do. Um, so, yeah, I would – I have more faith in whoever Washington puts out there as of this moment than I do in Ronald Jones. The, just, yeah. Though – you would think with Tom Brady there, he'll put him in advantageous uh, situations to succeed. But, mm, like I said, they're not. They're going to be a passing team. Like, I don't think they they brought Tom Brady there to hand the ball off to Ronald Jones. No offense to Ronald Jones. But they brought Bron- Gronk in, have Chris Godwin, have Mike Evans. Um, you saw the way um, James was airing it out last year. If uh, Tom can do a similar thing, just with obviously less interceptions, then, like I said, I think that's the way their offense is going to run. I don't think it's going to be a run-first offense. So, like I said, I just have a little bit more faith in them. So, I think I would rank the NFC East 1. You could say I'm biased. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I live on the East Coast. Um, my favorite team is the NFC East. So, you could say I'm biased. Um, but I just think the, the, the top three, if Miles Sanders elevates his game, the top three of Saquon, Zeke, and, and Miles is going to be tough for any division to compete with. Consistently. Because, again, all these guys are young. None of these guys are old. Zeke's the only one on the second contract right now. And Miles barely got used in college because he was behind Saquon, who many people were saying was the best running back in the league after his rookie year because all the things he was able to do. And many people still will say that he's the best running back in the league. So, I mean, that is me personally. I said if I were to wink, uh, not wink, rank them, um, I'll go south, I mean south, second, NFC East first, and then and an AFC North third, and then like the other ones are the other ones. Personally, kind of mean like not not any of them are outside the AFC East. None of them are really like that bad, but just like I just don't think they have the caliber of running back that these AFC North is a, is a is probably up there too. Personally, because again they have Nick Chubb. Oh no, not Nick Chubb. They have Aaron Jones and, and Dalvin Cook. And those those are two really good running backs. But like I said, they're who's their third? I don't know. Same with the AFC North. Like they have Nick Chubb. And they have the Mark Ingram, the Mar Jackson, who have would say, well, and they got Joe Mixon, so they have a good three. And then, like I said, if James Conner can be what he was, then boom, now you got a solid four. Like a lot of other divisions, don't have a solid four. They have a good two, maybe three, but then the fourth one is kind of up in the air. Even the AFC West isn't bad, but just that, like, you got to see how Philip Lindsay and Melvin Gordon work. You got to see. Um, how you use Clyde Edwards, Larry, and Damian Williams together, even though Andy Reid's an awful genius, so it'll be fine. Um, and they're playing with the best quarterback. You got to see how Austin Eckler does with the whole year being the guy. And then obviously you got to see how Josh Jacobs performs, though I don't think he'll be bad because the uh, uh, Raiders offensive line is good. So the AFC West probably would have been my fourth, just so I think they have four guys that you can potentially count on. And like I said, the NFC North is kind of up in the air. But like I said, NFC East one. NFC South 2, AFC North 3. But that's just me. But yeah, that'll do it for me here today on the GSMC Sports Podcast presented by GSMC Podcast Network. I want to thank you guys for listening as always. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast. If you like you've heard today, or you like what you've heard today, like what you've heard on past episodes, make sure you never miss an episode. Um, and this is the easy way to do that. Make sure you're always on top of when we drop. It'll help make sure you're always on top of when we drop our latest stuff. Also, if you could please as well, give us a five-star rating. Again, if you like to hear, um, give us a five-star rating, write us a nice review wherever you listen to your podcast. It would be very appreciated, very helpful. I'll see what you guys like, what you guys dislike, the ways you can improve, all that fun stuff. And also, if you're on social media, we're on social media, you can find us there. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, we can talk, we can chat, we can debate, we can discuss. You can give me your divisions ranked by their running backs or any other position. Let me know if you want to want to have me rank some of the other positions. I'll be closer to training camp and things and football and sports getting back together. Um, you can talk to me about what you think, how the bubbles are going to work. Um, you can talk to me about the Holmes deal. How do you th- how do you guys think it'll affect Dak and Deshaun coming up very soon with their deals? Um, I was going to talk about the Ivy League. Do you think spring football would work in college? I think it could, especially if you have athletes on campus or students on campus at that time. But hey, maybe you guys think like now falls falls it's falls football season. That's when we should have it. So 
Like I said, I'm willing to discuss any of that with you guys. So find us on social media um, and we can discuss it there. But yeah, before I get out of here, I want to, as I do every episode, give a shout out to the essential workers that are working through this pandemic or have worked through this pandemic. Um, doctors, nurses, EMTs, uh, firefighters, um, grocery store workers, retail workers. Whoever's been out there put literally putting their life on the line in order to make sure that the rest of us can get can live a relatively normal life. You are appreciated delivery drivers, um, especially Amazon workers in those warehouses. I know the conditions were or can be rough before that, before COVID hit. And not now, obviously, not a pandemic going around. So it's even more dangerous than it than I mean, I don't know how dangerous it was, but I know I hear a lot about long shifts and hot conditions. And like I said, now you're risking catching a virus. So, and again, just so me and people like me can get stuff over to our house because we can't leave because we can't go to the stores. So, shout out to you um, for, for like I said, doing that. Shout out to, like I said, the grocery store people or workers that have had to deal with people not adhering to store rules um, just because they feel like they can. It's not an uncommon thing that happens in retail all the time. People treat the retail workers any type of way just so they feel like they can, but it doesn't make it right. So, shout out to you. Having to work through a pandemic can deal with that, I imagine, has been very stressful. But hopefully, the time that you listen to this podcast, it has allowed you to ease that stress just a little bit. Um, but yeah, also, if you're going to go out, just wear a mask. That's all I'm going to say. It's simple. It's easy. You're going to be able to breathe. I promise. And plus... It'll help make sure that we can have sports to continue to discuss later on in the year. Because if the, the, these Rona numbers keep going up and they have to cancel sports again, we're going to be back on here talking about nothing. So at least now we have some stuff to look forward to. And if you want to make sure we continue to have that stuff to look forward to, everyone can do their part. And our part is just to wear a mask. It's simple. It's easy. I promise if we just do that, like we'll be like all these other countries that are back more open and doing stuff more normally as opposed to still kind of limited on the things we can and can't do in this country at this moment. But yeah, that'll do it for me here today. I've been Chris Blades. I want to thank you for your time. And until next time, peace out. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.